John chapter 1, verses 12 through 14. Let me start reading at verse 11. John 1, beginning at verse 11. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Amen. May God bless the public reading of His Word. And now, if you would, please turn in the back of the Psalter hymnal to the Shorter Catechism. Shorter Catechism. And we'll be looking at question 34, question and answer 34. So the Shorter Catechism found on page 970, page 970, question and answer 34. What is adoption? Adoption is an act of God's free grace, whereby we are received into the number and have a right to all the privileges of the sons of God. Amen. Well, this evening as we come to uh, John chapter 1, as we look at these verses in 11, verses 11 through 14, the theme of our sermon this evening is adoption, this great and glorious doctrine of adoption that we have been adopted into God's family for the sake of Christ and by faith in Him. And this is a most comforting doctrine for the Christian. Because think about it. We saw last Lord's Day, we meditated on the doctrine of justification. What is justification? It is an act of God's free grace wherein He pardons all of our sins. He accepts us as righteous in His sight only for the righteousness of Christ imputed to us and received by faith alone. So in our justification, God forgives all of our sins and He accepts us as righteous. We are declared righteous before God. And it's only on the basis of the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that righteousness is imputed to us. It is credited to us. Jesus Christ took our filthy rags upon Himself on the cross, and He gives us His perfect obedience, His perfect satisfaction, which is given to us, and we're clothed with the righteous robe of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we receive Christ and His righteousness by faith and faith alone. Justification by faith alone is at the heart of the gospel. It is at the heart of the good news of the gospel for us sinners. But think about this. What if God justified us? What if God forgave us, but then didn't want us to, didn't want to have much communion with us? What if God would have said, I forgive you for the sake of my son. You're forgiven and you're allowed into my heaven. But for the rest of eternity, I want you to sit in a corner over there. And I don't want to talk to you much. And I don't want this communion. But you are welcomed into heaven. That would have been glorious. But the good news of the gospel is that not only are we justified for the sake of Christ, we are also adopted for the sake of Christ into the family of God, so that the God who justifies, the God who has saved us from our sin and misery, that God has become our Father, our Father in heaven, so that we have communion with God, so that we who are justified, we who are redeemed, who are saved by grace through faith in Christ alone, can can also enjoy God and know Him as God and our God and call Him Abba, Father. What great blessing that is, to know God as our Father, to know God as the one 
who has brought us into joyful communion with Him. And so as we think about uh, the doctrine of adoption, our, our shorter catechism says that adoption is an act of God's free grace, just like justification is an act of God's free grace. Adoption is an act of God's free grace. It is by grace that we are adopted. And God receives us as His children, and we have a right to all the privileges of the sons of God. We have a right to all the privileges of the sons of God. As we come to our sermon text this evening, we see this glorious doctrine right here. Verse 12, but as many as received Him, as many as put their, uh, their trust in Him, to them gave He power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on His name. And so this evening then for our meditation, we'll meditate on the doctrine of adoption, and then we'll meditate on some of the privileges that we have as adopted children. So what is adoption? And then the privileges of our adoption. Here we see in verse 12, how is it that we are adopted into God's family? We're adopted into God's family not by our works. We're adopted by, uh, into God's family not because of our ethnicity or our background. We're adopted into God's family only one way, when we receive the Lord Jesus Christ, right? When we believe on his name. The principal acts of saving faith is to accept and receive and rest upon Christ alone for salvation as he is offered to us in the gospel. And anyone, regardless of the color of your skin, your ethnicity, the language you speak, whatever your background has been, anyone who puts their faith upon the Lord Jesus Christ and receives him as Savior and Lord is adopted into God's family. And the Lord Jesus gives us power to become the sons of God. Verse 13 says, which were born not of blood. Meaning salvation does not come uh, because of human lineage. No one can say, well, I deserve to be saved because I was born in a Jewish family or I was born in a Christian family. It is not of blood that we are born received into God's family. It is not because of ethnicity or family lineage, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. We cannot save ourselves. We cannot, by our own efforts, by our own uh, good works, bring ourselves to God, or put ourselves in a reconciled relationship with him, with him. We are helpless and hopeless as fallen sons and daughters of Adam. By nature, we're dead in our trespasses and sins. Therefore, we cannot save ourselves. But the good news of the gospel is that it is by the grace of God that we are saved. It is by the grace of God that we receive the Lord Jesus Christ by faith and by virtue of our union with Christ, we are justified, we're adopted, we are sanctified. And all other blessings that flow out of our union with Christ. We are blessed, as Ephesians chapter 1 says, with all spiritual blessings in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. It's in Jesus that we receive salvation. Amen? It's in, it's in the Lord Jesus Christ that we receive also this great blessing and benefit of adoption. And so let, let us remember this. No one can boast in their own upbringing. No one can boast in their Jewishness or, or in the fact uh, many of you children have been uh, raised and, and brought up in, in Christian homes, and yet you cannot boast about your upbringing as, as a merit to earn your adoption before God. You must come only one way, by faith in Jesus Christ. You must humble yourselves and put your trust entirely upon the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. This good news is for Jews and for Gentiles. Anyone who would come to the Lord Jesus Christ and would receive him and believe on his name is given this privilege to become the sons of God. There's only one way for us to receive 
to be received into God's family, and it is by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, children, a question arises. Well, Jesus Christ is called the only begotten Son of God. And here we're told in verse 12, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. So in what way is Jesus the only begotten Son of God if we are also called the children of God, the sons of God as Christians? Here's the difference. The Lord Jesus Christ is the only begotten Son of God by eternal generation. Jesus Christ is the only natural and eternal Son of God. But you and I become the sons of God by adoption. Jesus Christ is the eternal Son of God. And when we put our faith in Him, we become the children of God by adoption. And so verse 14 tells us that this eternal Son, the Word, the second person of the Trinity, in the fullness of the time, was made flesh. Jesus Christ came into the world to rescue hell-bound sinners like us, to save us from our sin and misery, that we might be justified and redeemed and adopted and sanctified. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father. God only has one eternal Son. It's Jesus Christ, who is co-equal, co-eternal with the Father and the Spirit as the only begotten Son of God. And He is full of grace and truth. And it's when we put our trust in this glorious Christ that we become heirs of God, co-heirs with Christ, and we have all the rights and the privileges of the sons of God. What a glorious doctrine that is. I'm sure that some of you have had difficult uh, parents or dads growing up. Some of us have had better dads than others. But every, every human dad, even the good ones, are sinners. But if you are in Christ, you receive the perfect Father. No unrighteousness in him. He is perfect. James 1 says he's the father of lights in whom there is no variableness, no shadow of turning. Every Christian has God as his father. What a blessing that is. What a blessing that is that our father in heaven is not capricious. He's not moody. He does not change his mind. He does not break his promises. He does not get uh, irritated with us. But he is a perfect father who loves his people with an everlasting love. He has ordained our redemption. He has chosen us in, in Christ from before the foundation of the world. In fact, Ephesians chapter 1 says this. Ephesians 1. Ephesians 1, beginning at verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, listen, having predestinated us unto what? The adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to to the good pleasure of His will, to the praise of the glory of His grace, wherein He hath made us accepted in the Beloved. Praise be to God. God has accepted us in the Beloved. He has predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ. All our blessings from God come to us by virtue of our union with Christ are you trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ? Are you united to Him by faith? If you are, then God is your Father. And He will never leave you nor forsake you. Those whom God has accepted in the Beloved, He will never reject. Those whom God has adopted and received as His children for the sake of Christ will never be unadopted. Praise be to God. 
Praise be to him. How encouraging that is for us as, as Christians as we go through various trials in life. As weak as we are, as we struggle with our own sins, we have a Father who loves us with an everlasting love because we are united to the Lord Jesus Christ. And he, by his free grace, by his uh, superabounding grace, has received us into his family. And we are his children, and he's our father. And therefore, we're encouraged to pray. What did Jesus say as we are to pray? We are to say, our Father, which art in heaven. He is our heavenly Father, who will not change. He is not like human fathers, even good ones. But he is a perfect Father, who does not change, and who does not leave nor forsake his children so as we think about this great and glorious doctrine of adoption, our Shorter Catechism says that we have a right and privileges of all of, of the sons of God. And so very briefly then, let us consider some privileges, some benefits of adoption. And I'm going to share with you six benefits of our adoption, and, and we can add many more uh, as we study God's Word and meditate on this doctrine of adoption. But let me share with you six benefits of adoption. The first benefit, then, is that we have, those of us who have been adopted into God's family by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, we have God's name put upon us. We have God's name put upon us. If you would uh, turn with me to Numbers chapter 6, I'll have you turn to a bunch of places in God's Word as we receive encouragement from Him. Turn to Numbers chapter 6, and this is a familiar passage. This is the Aaronic blessing. And notice Numbers chapter 6, beginning at verse 22. And the Lord Jehovah spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto Aaron and unto his sons, saying, On this wise ye shall bless the children of Israel, saying unto them, The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. And then look at verse 27. Listen. And they shall put my name upon the children of Israel, and I will bless them. So even at the end of the worship service, when the minister pronounces the words of benediction uh, in the name of the Lord, God has put his name upon you because you are united to the Lord Jesus Christ, because you're received into his family as his children, the Lord's name is upon you. Think about that. Jehovah's name is upon your heads. You belong to the living God. So we're told in 1 Corinthians 6 that our bodies are the temple of the Holy Ghost. We are not our own. The Heidelberg, Heidelberg Catechism tells us that we belong in body and in soul, in life and in death, to our faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. We belong to God. And then we have this wonderful promise in 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Second Corinthians chapter 6. And verse 18, And I will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. I will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters. We have God's name put upon us. We do not belong to the world. We do not belong to the devil. We're no longer under the tyranny and oppression of the devil. We're no longer slaves of sin. But as Christians, we belong to the Lord. His name is put upon us. And as an application then, the fact that God's name is put upon us, our identity is to be found in Christ, right? We are Christians. We are baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. We are children of God. Beloved, we must live that way. What is the application here in 2 Corinthians 6? The application is 
since we belong to God, we must separate ourselves from the works of darkness, right? Why? Because we don't belong to darkness anymore, but we belong to the God who is light, and in Him there is no darkness at all. And so a few verses uh, of uh, 2 Corinthians 6, we read, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? What communion hath light with darkness? What concord or agreement hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth? with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. And then this gracious promise, and be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters saith the Lord Almighty. Beloved congregation, people of God, you have God's name put upon you. So that when you, uh, even in your darkest moments as Christians, when you fail, and you will fail, even this week we will fail, right? Even this week we will sin. Remember this, God's name is upon you. You belong to Him, and He is a gracious Father. And when you come to the Lord Jesus Christ, when you confess your sins before God, when you run to Him with humility, you will always find help. You will never find condemnation. If you are in Christ, you, there is no condemnation to you. Think about that. You've been delivered from the curse of the law, and you will find grace upon grace as you run to your Heavenly Father by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. God's name is put upon you. Secondly, then, the second benefit of adoption is that we have the spirit of adoption. We have the spirit of adoption who indwells us. 1 Corinthians 6 tells us that our bodies are the temple of the Holy Ghost. And if you would turn with me to Romans chapter 8, Romans chapter 8, let's let's read a few verses in Romans chapter 8. This is speaking to Christians, beginning at verse 9. Romans 8, verse 9. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness." But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that what? Dwelleth in you. (coughs) So we're told in verse 9 that if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he's none of his. Every Christian has the Holy Spirit. Amen? Every Christian. It's not as though there are some that that have the Spirit and others who don't. It's not as though after we're saved, we have to wait for a little while and perhaps there's a second, um, second work of grace and then we are baptized with the Spirit or we receive the fullness of the Spirit. No, no. If you are in Christ, you have the Holy Spirit who dwells in you because the Holy Spirit is called in verse 9, the Spirit of Christ. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. To be a Christian is to be indwelt by the Holy Spirit. To be a Christian is to be the temple of the Holy Spirit. You have the Holy Spirit. You have been given the Holy Spirit. And one of the things, one of the titles of the Holy Spirit is, listen, the Spirit of Adoption. The Spirit of of adoption. So look at verse 14 of Romans 8. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Verse 15. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received who? The spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Praise be to God. 
We as Christians have the Comforter, as we read this morning in our New Testament reading. The Lord Jesus sent another Comforter, and that Comforter, the Spirit of Truth, God the Holy Ghost, is with us and dwells in us. And the Holy Spirit is called here the Spirit of Adoption. And by the Spirit, by the Holy Spirit, we cry out to the Lord. And we say, Abba, Father. Abba, Father. Verse, uh, verse 16. The Spirit itself, or the Spirit himself, beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. The Spirit bears witness with our spirits that we are the children of God. Verse 17, and if children, then heirs. We are heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may, also, we may be also glorified together. How comforting it is. And how... Um, encouraging it is to know that the Holy Spirit indwells us. As Christians, we are no longer under the tyranny of the devil, and a true Christian can never be indwelt by an evil spirit because we have the Holy Spirit. But watch this. Although we can never be controlled or indwelt by an evil spirit, Christians can put themselves in, in, in positions where, where they are exposed to demonic deception. And therefore, we need to make sure that we are walking not by the lusts of the flesh, but by the Spirit. In other words, we need to live under the sovereignty of the Holy Spirit as adopted children of God. Not as unwise, but as those that are wise in the Lord, leaning not unto ourselves, but leaning upon the everlasting arm and trusting in the Lord as we walk by faith in him we have the spirit of adoption whereby we are enabled the holy spirit enables us to cry us cry out to the lord as abba father third benefit of our adoption is that we have access to god's throne of grace we have access to god's throne of grace think about that because we have been reconciled to God, because we are no longer enemies of God, but there is peace between us and God, and not only are we justified, but we're also adopted, and, and therefore we are encouraged and commanded to pray and not lose heart, right? I made a reference in, the, in our congregational prayer about this parable of the persistent widow, and this widow was crying out for mercy, and the judge that she was dealing with was an unjust judge who couldn't care any less for her. He didn't care for her, and yet she kept asking, she kept knocking, and at the end, the judge was frustrated, and just to get her off his back, he decided to avenge her. He decided to help her and give her justice. But Jesus encourages us. But what about us? We are not in that situation as that per, uh, widow was. We are not dealing with an unjust judge, but we are dealing with the judge of the universe. And that ju judge of the universe has become our father for the sake of Christ. How much more should we pray and not lose heart? How much more should we persevere in our prayers, crying out to the Lord and not despair or not give up or lose heart? God is our Father in heaven, and He's perfect and righteous and just, and there is no unrighteousness in Him. Will God not hear the cries of His children and answer and provide and sustain? Of course he will. We have access to the throne of grace, and therefore we are encouraged to pray. If you would turn to uh, the book of Hebrews, we have this wonderful uh, verse. In Hebrews chapter 4, we're told in verse 15, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. As adopted children, 
Not only are we encouraged, but we are also commanded to pray because we have direct access to God. Think about that. We have direct access to God. I mean, if you wanted to meet with the president of this nation, perhaps you'd have to take an make an appointment. You might have some security check, background check, whatever, and you might get a few moments of audience with the president. And then, if you want to see him again, you have to go through another lengthy process. But with the God of the universe, we have direct access. And we can go to him anytime. Every time we're in trouble, we can reach out to the Lord and He hears us because we have access to the throne of grace because the judge of the universe, the Holy God, has become our Heavenly Father. We should pray and not lose heart. I'm reminded of this uh, seminary professor, I forget his name, uh, perhaps Hodge, but when he, uh, when he came to the, the seminary, I think it was Princeton Seminary, and as a, as a new professor, you know, he was shown where he would be uh, living and staying on campus, and the house where he would be staying, and he was shown his study, and this professor requested that the lock on the door of his study be removed so that even when he is in the intense part of his study, his son might barge in any time and come to him for help. He doesn't need any lock on the door to keep his son away from him, but the son has access to the father. He could come and cry out for help. How much more is our father in heaven willing and able and pleased to receive us into his presence as we need him every moment we are encouraged to pray and not lose heart, for we are adopted into God's family. We have access to the throne room of God. Praise be to Him. We have access to the throne room of God. Do we pray? Is prayer something that we're cultivating? Are we making diligent use of prayer, knowing that we are God's adopted children? Beloved, I want to encourage you. Devote yourselves to the reading of God's Word and to prayer. As I said this morning, when we read God's Word, God is communing with us. He's speaking to us. And as we pray, we speak to Him. We commune with Him. And we need both reading of the Word and then crying out to God in prayer. Pray and not lose heart. Fourth uh, benefit of adoption is this. We are pitied by our Father. We are protected by our Father, and we are provided for by our Father. We are pitied, protected, and provided for. Psalm 103 is a very precious psalm, isn't it? Where David is encouraging his own soul. He's preaching the gospel to his own soul. And he calls his soul to bless the Lord and forget not all his benefits. And one of the benefits that David recounts in that psalm is this. Psalm 103 in verse 13. Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord, Jehovah, pitieth them that fear him. As a father has compassion. If an earthly father, who is a sinner, can have compassion upon, upon his children, how much more, infinitely more, does God have compassion and pity upon those who fear him, upon those who have been brought into communion with him? through the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are pitied as God's children. We're also protected as God's children. Proverbs 14 and verse 26 says this, In the fear of the Lord is strong confidence, listen, and His children shall have a place of refuge. The children of God shall have a place of refuge. We are protected by our Father in heaven, who holds us in His hands, and underneath are the everlasting arms. We are protected by our Father in heaven. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runneth into it and is safe. Psalm 46 says, God is our refuge and our strength, our very present help in trouble. The Lord cares for us. And he provides for us. And notice how Jesus, our Lord, encourages us to not be anxious, but to trust in our Heavenly Father. Matthew chapter 6. 
Matthew. Matthew chapter 6. Beginning at verse 25. Matthew 6 verse 25. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought, or do not be anxious for your life, what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body what ye shall put on. Is not the life more than meat, and the body than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into, your, into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Which of you by taking thought can add one cubit unto his stature? And why take ye thought, or why do you worry for raiment, for clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they toil not, neither do they spin. Yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast in the, into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewith all shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. God, our Father, provides for us his children. Therefore, let us not be anxious. We're supposed to work hard. We're supposed to do all that God has called us to do and carry out our vocation by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is not saying here that we shouldn't work, that we should just sit around. No, we work. We work as Christians. But we realize this, that it is the Lord who provides for us our daily bread. It is the Lord who provides for us good health and the ability to work. It is the Lord who cares for his children. Therefore, let us not be anxious, but in everything, with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let us make our requests be made known unto God. And he promises us peace, which surpasses all understanding. Let us not be anxious, but let us pray, for we are provided for by our Father in heaven. So we are pitied, protected, and provided for. Two more. Fifth benefit of adoption, we are sealed to the day of redemption. We are sealed to the day of redemption. Listen to Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 30. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. As children, we are sealed with the Holy Spirit unto the day of redemption. In other words, those whom God has accepted in the beloved, he will not leave us in the middle along the way, but he will sustain us all the way to the end. And as an application, do not grieve the Holy Spirit, which by the way means that the Holy Spirit is a person, right? Because he could be grieved. Cults like JWs, Jehovah's False Witnesses, would claim that the Holy Spirit is some force or, you know, like electricity, some impersonal force, but the Holy Spirit is a person, the third person in the Godhead, and he can be grieved. And as Christians, we can grieve the Spirit who indwells us when we persist in sin, when we uh, walk away from the Lord. Let us not grieve the Holy Spirit, but by the grace of God, let us walk in the Spirit. Let us be humble. Let us pursue repentance. Repentance is not something that we've, we done, that, that, that we've done once in the past and we're done with repentance. But repentance is a daily reality in the Christian life. Amen? Christian life is a life of repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ so that we're encouraged to repent every day and cast ourselves at the mercies of the Lord Jesus Christ and confess our sins. And instead of grieving the Holy Spirit, we are to be filled with the Spirit. And by the way, how are we filled with the Spirit? We're filled with the Holy Spirit when we're filled with the Word of God. We're told in Colossians 3, let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. And Ephesians 5, which is a parallel passage, tells us be filled with the Spirit. It is through the Word that we are filled with the Spirit. The more as Christians we are Word-filled, 
the more we are spirit-filled. And as a church, the more we're filled with the Word of God, the more the Holy Spirit is at work in our lives to sanctify us and to conform us to the image of Christ. Christian, you are sealed with the Holy Spirit unto the day of redemption, which means if you are in Christ, you are eternally secure in Him. And knowing that does not produce lawlessness. Knowing that we are secure by God produces a pursuit of holiness, a pursuit of holiness and obedience and submission to the Lordship of Christ. Do not grieve the Spirit with whom you are sealed until the day of redemption. And then finally, people of God, the sixth benefit of adoption, we are kept by the power of God. We are kept by the power of God, and therefore we, nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. As I said at the beginning of the sermon, those whom God has adopted, He will never unadopt. Those that have been received as the children of God can never become children of hell because God is a perfect Savior. And those whom He has saved, He will keep to the end. So we're reminded in, in Philippians 1, He who has begun a good work in us will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ, right? The one who began a good work in His children, He will perform it. He will perfect it. He will not leave us in the middle, he will not leave us nor forsake us. But turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. Beginning at verse 3, 1 Peter 1 verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance which is incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. What's the guarantee that we'll get to this inheritance which is reserved in heaven for us? What's the guarantee? Notice the very next verse, verse 5. Who are what? Kept by the power of God. Is there any power greater than God's power? You are kept by the power of God through faith, unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. And then notice the application. I love how the Word of God uh, gives us this glorious doctrine and then tells us in light of this doctrine how we ought to live. So look at verse 6. Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations. As we go through the manifold temptations and trials in this life, we are to encourage ourselves in the fact that we are kept by the power of God unto salvation, through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. The faith that God has given us as a gift is a persevering faith. And as Christians, we will persevere to the end because the Father and the Son and the Spirit, the triune God, preserves us in the one true faith to the end. Therefore, let us not be discouraged because we are adopted into God's family. Ephesians chapter 1 tells us, uh, Ephesians 1 and verse 13, In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance, until the redemption of the purchased possession, unto the praise of His glory. We are sealed with the Holy Spirit. Who is the guarantee that we will acquire possession of the inheritance inheritance that we have because we are adopted children. We're heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Isn't that glorious? Now, two more observations before we close. close. One, but you might say, but what if I mess up so badly or if I sin so grievously that God is done with me or He, he, uh, he abandons me because I have sinned one too many times. The good news of the gospel is that God will never leave us nor forsake us. But if we are his adopted children, listen, he will discipline us. He will discipline us, but he will never abandon us. 
we need to be encouraged. If you would turn to Hebrews, again, the book of Hebrews. And chapter 12, Hebrews chapter 12, we're encouraged here. Verse 5, Hebrews 12, verse 5, And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto what? Children, my son, despise, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he what? Chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. So here's the point. We as Christians will be chastened by our loving Father, but we will never be abandoned by him. We will not be abandoned because he is committed to us. He loves us with an everlasting love. And even in his chastening, he loves us. It's for our good. It's for our growth and grace. In light of that, we need to listen to the word of God. We need to make sure that we're not despising the chastening of the Lord, but that everything that comes our way comes to us by the fatherly hands of God, right? Whatever happens to us, if you are in Christ, whatever will happen to you in the future will come to you by the hands of a God who is your father and who loves you with an everlasting love so that you can rest in him, you can trust him, and by his grace, you can pursue holiness knowing that he is for you and not against you. So those of you, again, who are not in Christ and you're hearing about these glorious benefits of adoption, why would you not come to the Lord Jesus Christ? Why would you not want God to be your father in heaven? Why would you not want to be in reconciled relationship with God? Why would you desire pig food when there is a banquet which is laid before you? You must come to the Lord Jesus Christ. You must repent and cast yourselves at the mercies of Christ. He says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I'm meek and lowly of heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, my burden is light. Come to the Savior. And as you do, as you rest in Christ alone for your salvation, know that God brings you into his family. And you're adopted, adopted as God's children. He's for you. Those of you who are in Christ Jesus, let that encourage you. Meditate upon the glory of our adoption in the Lord Jesus Christ and our Father who loves us with an everlasting love and nothing can separate us with the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Let us turn then to the singing of God's praise as we respond.